So I'll just tell you uh, while we're working on it a little bit uh, about, uh, about us. Um, um, I come at the big data problem at a little bit different uh, uh, angle, if you will. I spent a lot of time uh, in my career working with uh, real-time operating systems, with um, uh, operating system internals and so forth. And, um, you know, we did the operating system that's in the Hubble telescope, and we did a lot of underwing armaments, and we've done a lot of a lot of things like that. And so it, um, it's kind of a strange way to end up, you know, dealing with, with big data. But there's a lot of learning about applications and how they interact with the operating system and what applications do and so forth. And uh, oh, and so um, it was, uh, you know, from that did a lot of work with um, uh, application virtualization. And um, let's see, what do we need to do here? There we go. got the other wrong way around. Thank you very much. So anyway, um, um, did a lot of work with application virtualization, which sort of uh, uh, allowed us to develop and understand a technology that allows us to um, uh, put a small amount of code inside an application, inside a process, and be able to control what that does. And that's sort of the, the core of the application virtualization stuff. We um, wanted to do a, a something different with that and uh, with that same technology and which brought us to um, rather than controlling uh, applications we were doing things like running Slurs 2.6 apps on Slurs 2.10 what we what we did with it instead was um, look at gathering information from in the, these applications and it, it turns out to work really well um, however um, what we ended up doing was getting a lot of data out of these apps um, a tremendous amount of data so um, we started up first um, um, a couple years ago. Uh, we're a, a New York uh, City startup. Um, we, uh, what we do uh, now with this technology is that we aggregate data from remote servers. We install a small piece of software on your servers running in the cloud, your production servers, right? That allows us to collect uh, uh, a very large amount of data from every single process, every single socket, Every file that's accessed, you know, tremendous amount of, uh, of details. That data is uploaded to our back end, and we process the data, and then um, uh, allow you to visualize it and correlate it and so forth. I'll get into those details. But what that, what that ends up doing is that we end up um, collecting data from now tens of thousands of remote computers, you know, sending data to us. It's a constant stream of data. We get that data uh, three times a minute on a, on a regular basis, nonstop. Um, we, uh, the, the result is that we're now summarizing 45 to 50,000 summaries every minute um, that results in gigabytes um, uh, per day from every one of those 10,000 remote servers. So we are therefore, as a result of that, bringing in terabytes of new data every day. Um, and then um, the other requirement with that, with all that data is that it could be queried and serve back up in less than 10 milliseconds. So in order to meet the web application kind of requirements, the data had to be back in, um, in, in tens of milliseconds or you just, you know, you, 
it, it's going to take so long to um, render the, the page and stuff that the applications just don't work. So um, we are uh, storing that data for up to a year. Um, so um, just to sort of introduce this to you, if that gives you a background on the kind the scope of what we're doing. This is a very simplified view of what we're currently doing, what our current architecture is. Um, we look at it in three areas. Um, the first, we have these remote collectors that send data to um, our, our uh, aggregation uh, mechanism. And we, this is where we create these summaries and all the data is processed and uh, has to be processed in real time. We want the data available um, up to no more than a minute past walk clock time. So if we capture the data at 12 o'clock, you want the data to be available at 12.01. So um, it's, um, and then the storage mechanism um, uh, is, is based on uh, HBase, uh, where uh, we've got a couple different clusters and uh, we're learning our way through um, some of the things with HBase and dealing with um, some of the growing pains as you get into scaling some of this. I, uh, it's sort of easy to come to a conference like this and, and, and get exposed to what some of the technologies will do, like Hadoop and HBase. It's a whole other thing to um, design and deploy something and then try to, you know, figure out how to make that thing uh, scale to multiple petabytes of data with, um, with uh, massive amounts of writes every, uh, you know, every, every, every minute. Um, the third thing that we have in our architecture is a web applications platform, and um, it's pretty straightforward in terms of what the web application platform is. Um, it's a, 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 a Django web uh, framework. Um, we uh, have a, a, a local um, a database uh, uh, for what we describe as static data. This is just you know our users and. Um, their profiles and usernames and passwords and stuff, static data, not the data that we're collecting. And all that data, the, the, the actual data that we're collecting about, you know, your applications and stuff is stored in HBase. Um, what the web application is used for is to, um, uh, as a platform to host the REST APIs. So all the data is then uh, made available through REST APIs. So our applications, as we write them, use these APIs and um, uh, we're starting to put um, uh, quite a few now um, uh, of the applications that we built into open source so you can look at it in you know, dashboarding technologies and things like that so you can look at, the, uh, at that stuff. So that gives you a quick background of what the architecture looks like. We, um, what we want to talk about is you know, the uh, problems that, we, that we've run into that I suggest that a lot of people run into when you try to design something for scale. We, um, to give you a feel for the scale, we started, we actually had a party at our uh, uh, facility or loft in, in, in New York City when we, when we were supporting 100 remote servers. We were like, yes, 100, we, this is, you know, and then, you know, and then, you know, and then pretty soon it's 1,000. And then, and then pretty soon it's like, well, you know, there's a customer and now we're looking at 10,000 and what do you, you know, I mean, it's just a, it's just an order of magnitude things, you know, so how do you, how do you scale this? So um, we um, look at scale in two ways. We look at scale in a, in a, a macro scale context and a, and a micro scale context. And we think of micro scale as being um, scale of application component. So, so the application taxonomy as we look at it is that our entire, um, service that you just saw in a previous slide is the application. And um, that application consists of a number of components. HBase is a component, Postgres is a component, our code that we have to uh, process all the data is a component and so forth. And each of those components are made up of multiple processes that run on multiple servers. So when we talk about micro scale, we're really talking about scale within those components. How does our processing of the data scale within that component, right? How does HBase scale? How does um, the, the web application platform itself scale and so forth? Macro scale, what we're looking at is how that entire service scales to capacity. How do we take that entire service and move it from 1,000 remote servers to 10,000 remote servers and now to many, many tens of thousands of uh, remote servers? That's and, and, and they're different, at least in the way that we approach the problem. So 
if we look first at the micro scale, um, what what that this is really about our ability to, about the ability to to process the data, right? So the requirements are that you have this constant stream of data from now tens of thousands of remote servers sending us gigabytes of data every day per server, per remote server. And creating these snapshots uh, for it, so we have three snapshots from each of these remote servers that come in per minute, right? So three, every 20 seconds, we get this, you know, uh, 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 compressed and encrypted uh, XML from these remote servers that when then we process that, create, take these snapshots and you have to combine them in, into a time series and and um, I'll explain it a little bit more and what we do with them in, in a second. And um, there's a lot of processing that, that goes into it. And then we have to provide the ability to um, uh, query the results and so forth. And a couple of the uh, graphics uh, show you on, on the bottom the, the kinds of things that we do when we're done with all of that data. And the kind of data these are showing you kind of what some of your um, uh, application specific kind of details would look like or your business details. Okay. So this really becomes uh, all about efficiency. And um, what we found was in order to serve data up in tens of milliseconds, we couldn't store data in any kind of a relational model and then try to do queries on it and combine tables and so forth. We also couldn't actually write data into a relational data model, in any relational database as fast as, as was required. It's, it was somewhat of a surprise to us that the writes are what failed first in, in that relational model. But um, it was just such a volume of them that you, that you really couldn't get through it. So what we had to do was, was pre-summarize the data, right, and put it into a time series and so forth so that when we went back to query it, we were looking for data um, in, in a given time series. And, um, and the, the time series makes a lot of sense if you, if you look at the, the kinds of things we're doing. If you are trying to determine what your application, what your service was doing, oftentimes you start when something bad happens and that's an, you have an event. At this point in time, I want to know what was going on when, in, in my application. So you are, it's kind of a natural uh, use of this data for it to be in a time series anyway. So. We summarize the data uh, based on server uh, uh, data itself. You know, it's a, it's a standard kind of stuff you, you see with your server data. Uh, the amount of memory, that, the total amount of memory, memory used and disk and uh, network throughput and all those kind of things, disk busy values, stolen time values, all those kinds of things. Um, then we summarize individual processes as a, as a second kind of summary. So we, we see, uh, every single, we, we, we have code living inside of every single process on every single VM, on every single server, you know, in your, in your system. And then, um, so we summarize each of those processes um, separately. We um, create sets of processes. So, for example, if you have um, a web farm that consists of 12 VMs, let's say, and you're running um, Apache on, on that, and uh, you've got five uh, processes per uh, Apache. You've now got 60 processes on these 12 VMs. What we do is we, we um, allow those 60 processes to be combined into one object called your web farm, right? And so you can interact with that as, as one entire object. That has to be summarized as, as you get into this. You have to know what you're combining, pull all that data in when it's available, <coughs> aggregate it separately as a set and so forth. And then we create what we describe as topology data, which is your network details, which is um, we have data from every single socket on every single process, so then we, we summarize um, the uh, uh, IP addresses and port numbers on your local, the remote IP address, the protocol, the number of, the bandwidth detail, all the bytes sent and bytes received, the uh, response times, average response times, transactions, all of that data then gets pulled together and, and, and pulled into one summary just for uh, network data, for topology. And then we'll take all that data and aggregate it into a minute summary. So server summary per minute, process summary per minute, process sets per minute, topology per minute. Then we'll aggregate that minute data into hour data, and then we take that hour data and aggregate it into day data. 
So we end up with 12 different summaries as you go through all this processing, okay? Our, our sort of list of what we tried over here is um, um, we, we did actually, I hate, this, I hate to actually admit it, but we actually did, when we very first started this, this started with flat files. And um, uh, as you can well imagine, it didn't go very far. Um, didn't scale very far at all. Uh, we did spend a lot of time doing some R&D work uh, on various uh, storage uh, mechanisms and so forth and looked a lot at um, all kinds of things, uh, a number of relational models, uh, a number of NoSQL models, and uh, Cassandra and MongoDB and, um, and all kinds of stuff, a lot, uh, several um, uh, SQL technologies that are in memory databases. Um, very fast but hard to scale, um, things like that. And, and we arrived at HBase as being um, um, what we're person. So far, it's worked really well. Um, as long as you can keep HBase from running into table hotspotting and different things like that, um, it's actually, um, it, it works as long as you can sort of keep it, keep your cluster managed correctly as you go. Um, very important thing that we learned is, um, as we're processing all this data and trying to do it all in real time, you can't store any of that data on disk. We couldn't, we, do, we just had to, just had to accept the fact that it had to be an entire RAM-based design. You couldn't get it onto disk and do anything with it. And, and this is sort of what Jim Gray at Microsoft is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the quote, it's, it's, it's a somewhat famous quote, um, is uh, basically what he's saying is, um, disk is tape now, right? So where we all think about tape as being so slow and takes so long to get stuff on and off and so forth, disk has sort of become that at, at, at this stage. And you, um, what we've learned is all of the processing of our data has to be completed in all 12 of those summaries before you write anything into HBase because you just can't hit the spindle. The pure physics, if you look at, we did the math, if you do the pure physics of the spindle rotation and so forth, you'll, you'll quickly realize why you actually can't get the data written and read back off of disk in anything near the kind of time frames you need. If, if you're doing any processing of the data with um, real-time constraints, you know. Um, so um, it's a hard lesson to learn. I wish I'd have found Jim Gray's quote, um, uh, you know, a, a, a couple years uh, sooner. Um, this is the architecture that we ended up with to do the processing of the data. If you recall, in the previous slide, I had three sections. There's the aggregation, storage, and the web platform. This is what the aggregation is. Um, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting design. We, um, um, it's based on how high-performance high computing works in a pipeline model, right? So um, you, um, you know, so the, the, the largest computers that do all the large processing will do everything in a pipeline with uh, potentially rendezvous and checkpoints and those kinds of things, right? It, this is similar to that. It's a, uh, uh, so it's a full pipeline model. We'll have, we'll first level the pipeline will do its work, store the results into a distributed shared memory, and then um, signal a, a tracker that it's done with its work. Uh, we, tracker is sort of a uh, con uh, traffic cop, if you will. And then, um, for example, you know, you, you got to know that all your one minute summaries are available and then you can start to do your application or your, your process sets uh, summaries after they're available that kind of thing so you sort of have, have something that keeps track of those kinds of sequences in in this and so when one part of the uh, work is done to pipeline it goes to the next level in the pipeline and so on At the very bottom of the pipeline when you're all done with the processing then we'll write the results out to uh, out to HBase um, what we did is we use a queuing model. It's sort of a message of a passing bus is what it is. What we, um, what we do with the uh, queuing as much as possible is to um, not write data into the queues, right? So you want to, um, um, because you know all that data ends up uh, getting stored in RAM on the uh, queue servers anyway. So um, you, you, you if you don't do, if you do too much of that, you end up with a lot, with the data being sort of duplicated in too many places, because you've got it in memcache and distributed shared memory. You put the data in the queues as well, then it's stored on queue servers and, and so forth. So um, what we do instead is we take 
um, keys to where the data lives, and we pass them up and down in, in the uh, queue servers. So you are, when first level in the pipeline reads its data out of shared memory, um, operates on it, writes it back into a different place in shared memory, takes the key for where that data is, puts it in the, in the queue so that the next level in the pipeline can just read data. Uh, read, what he reads out of his queue is a key to where the data is. Gets the data, operates on it, writes his output out, puts the, the key to the uh, new data into the queue, and so on and so forth. And it just steps through the pipeline that way. Um, it's very fast. Uh, we can process a tremendous amount of data with this model uh, very, very quickly. Um, one of the things that becomes real critical to us in this model is that all of this processing becomes completely stateless. You cannot afford to store any state about the processing you're doing in local memory or in local disk at all for any of this. So all of the state information that determines what you're doing as you're processing this has to get stored back into distributed shared memory. It's kind of difficult to work with when you first sort of start doing it, it, it really sort of takes a thought process around, a very deliberate thought process and a, and a very well abstracted data model so that you can, the, the data model for this kind of thing becomes extremely important in, in the abstraction of the data so that you don't inadvertently put too much knowledge of where the data is or where it lives and how to get it inside some of the processing becomes critical. But when you do that, the advantage is um, a very, very, very solid way of doing um, horizontal scaling, right? Because now these, this, these, these compute elements doing this processing can live on any server um, and can, uh, we, we can um, shut them down, migrate them, do maintenance on something, put them back because there's no state. You just shut them off. And, um, do what you need to. So the other thing that happens as load increases, um, you handle new load by just starting up more processes in, in, in whatever area of the pipeline that, that, that's suffering because of the load. Um, um, so it makes the management of, of this um, much, much, much easier. We um, have realized that we um, really needed to get to some adaptive control, meaning that we can't respond fast enough to changes in, in some of this stuff and, and when, it, when it happens. So we just had to write our own um, control mechanisms that watch what is happening and will um, dynamically um, add more uh, compute as needed <coughs> in different areas of the pipeline and so forth. And, um, and it's, you just, you know, it, it works really well when you get it. Um, Okay, so we all know that we need to scale horizontally. You've heard it earlier today in, in several talks and so forth, but it's, um, you know, I, I haven't, I have not heard very many people in, in the talks I've gone to or even much of the stuff I've read that where people talk about what that means and how you actually do it, you know. Um, but what we've learned is you cannot just go out and buy bigger hardware. To solve a problem, it's it's a it's a slippery slope. You can't do it. You've got you've got to figure out how to architect these kinds of things so that they scale um, horizontally, and you can just add, you know, more processes and uh, uh, wherever you need them. So um, um, this is sort of the summary of what that means. I guess the, the the one thing that we learned is to look for ways of using components that cluster and, and, and not are just, you know, sort of simple master-slave kind of things, you know, so MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, and so forth will work in a master-slave mode and in a backup and so forth, but it's not a cluster. You really need a cluster in order to be able to bring nodes down and do maintenance on them in order to really scale it dynamically and so forth. So it was one thing that we learned and we just, when we were looking at some of these technologies, we realized very quickly that you had to get something that just clusters. So. We'll talk quickly about um, um, macro scale. How do you how do you scale this stuff uh, in, in in the uh, highest in the broadest sense? Um, the uh, this really becomes where component scale, or what we think of as micro scale, what we describe as micro scale, is all about performance and, and and so forth. This is really about capacity. 
you know, how do you take this design and go from a thousand to ten thousand to you know hundreds of thousands? And um, one of the first thing that that we had to do was we had to understand where the load really comes from and what causes the the, the real sort of pain in, in this and and you very quickly understand that it is the load imposed on this application from the remote servers far outweighs the load from interactive users and, and API traffic. API traffic does, hasn't ever come anywhere near the type of load that you get from processing the data and so forth. So we start there, right? So if you get something that works for, for 10,000 remote servers, is that same architecture going to work when you need to scale to 100,000? Or do you have to, are there, are there holes you have to do things significantly different? We um, started with this premise here, that you don't try to design for infinite scale. You don't try to take something that supports, that's working, that supports a reasonable capacity for your application, and then just try to scale that, and scale it again, and scale it again. It, it, it's a, it creates really difficult behavior in the, in the development design teams. It, it, it creates um, kind of behavior that, you're, that, that you really don't want because you're, you know, you're, you're sort of chasing the unknown. At the same time, you really can't say no to the business. The reason, we're a startup, right? And we, um, we are doing everything we can to, to be able to generate business. And when someone comes in with business, that you know, customer comes in and they've got 10,000 servers, you can't say no. You've got to do something about it. So what do you do, right? Um, so, what we did was we um, we wanted to create essentially a, a pod model. We'd have multiple pods that could that could design that could support scale, and we could scale based on these pods. So, and, and trying to figure out how to do a pod, what we did is we started with a uh, snapshot of what does this application look like when it supports a thousand servers. It, it requires this kind of compute, this kind of processing, this kind of storage, and so on and so forth. And then um, we looked at how we would just scale that. And we did a very simple linear scale of it. And um, then the question became, well, what scale to what? What's the right capacity and so forth? And then that really, be for us, became a financial calculation. It was far less about the technology in terms of what would work and so forth, and far more about um, uh, from a from a company standpoint, from a business standpoint, um, you want to get a number. If, if the number is too small, if the capacity that you can support in in, in one processing element, what we call a pod, a pod um, is too small, then um, you're having to instantiate too many pods too fast. If it's too big, then you're, you're paying for resources that you haven't used for some period of time. So you want a number that, it, that sort of makes sense for the business. And we came up with a number of 10,000. So we said that we wanted to be able to support 10,000 remote servers in one instance of this architecture. And um, so what we did then is we said, um, we segmented that architecture around the load lines, and we said, okay, we're going to build one um, instance of this architecture to support 10,000 remote servers. When we get to 85, 90% of that capacity, we instantiate a second pod that we can then do the next 10,000 and the next 10,000 and so forth. And you just keep stamping out pods as you go. So um, then what we did do is look at how to scale within the pod on, on 1,000 server increments. So we could do a first instance of that that would support 1,000 remote connectors or collectors. We could add another node in the uh, pod to do 2,000 and so forth, up to 10,000, you're done. The, the key here is that you want to be able to test uh, to a, a fixed number. You don't want you know, to have to do QA and so forth on things that are infinite, that you don't know what they are. Okay, so we know this works at 10,000. Will it work with 50,000? I don't know. We haven't tested it. I mean, you, you don't want to get yourself in that position. It's a, it's a scary place to be. So, obviously, the big deal here is to um, be able to automate the deployment of these things, you know, to be able to, um, you know, um, 
uh, do some of what we heard about earlier in terms of uh, from uh, you know Nazit uh, Shalom about the, the the way you would go about instantiating um, and deploying uh, uh, something like this in in a, in a cloud environment, right? And um, you know you want to be able to do that automatically and so forth. We've we've got it automated. It's not perfect. We got a lot of work to do in the automation of 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 a pod, but we've got a, it, it's a decent start, um, and we're learning a lot. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's interested, but just as a as a data point, um, this is a hybrid environment where we run a lot of this stuff on physical compute, and a lot of it can run on uh, in, in the cloud. It's just pure compute and so forth. So a lot of the aggregation is just pure compute and can run in the cloud environment. But a lot of the other um, stuff like the HPACE uh, uh, and a couple of other key components we run on physical bare metal, uh, and um, so. We'll summarize uh, with uh, some of the lessons learned. Um, you really, um, if you get into something with, we learned anyway that, that we really needed to have some adaptive control. We we didn't, uh, we we just couldn't keep up with things. We we couldn't do it fast enough manually ourselves. We couldn't have, you know, people getting um, email and SMS, you know, in the middle of the night, and then getting up and going and looking at something and fixing things and so forth. You just can't do it. So we had to write code that would um, recognize what the system itself is doing and then correct it. And so we could scale things and we could shut things up, you know, spin things down and so on and so forth. Um, you know, you learn a lot about that it's better to run in a degraded mode than shut down, you know, things like that. That's what adaptive control does. It allows you to, if, if you're into, especially, in, well, I don't know why, everything has to happen in the middle of the night. Why in the world does it have to happen? But there's like this unwritten rule that if something's going to break, it has to be at 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't know why. It, just, it has to be. So, you know, running in degraded mode until 9 o'clock in the morning is better than having the site go down. Those are the kinds of things that you do with adaptive control. Um, metrics. you got to have metrics with this stuff. You can't, you can't be guessing. you got to know in a lot of detail what things are doing. We found that we needed... All the network topology stuff we talked about, we need process details, we need um, all that stuff, as well as business metrics about our application and so forth. Last thing I want to mention on this slide is don't trust the data. What we mean by that is <clears throat> the data is going to be corrupted. Um, it, 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 no, matter, no matter what you do, it's going to be bad at, at some level, and you're going to have to just adjust to it. You're going to have to fix things and understand that what we do with bad data is um, <clears throat> store it into a separate queue and go on so that we can later come on, pull the bad data out, run our code against it, and find out what's failing. It's, it's a neat little trick, actually. Um, so there you go. There's our, there's our conclusions. Um, and um, stateless and don't write the disk. Those are the biggies. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Hi. So, uh, writing to disk is very slow. It's, it should be forbidden, almost. So, what, what do you do when you have big data? You have to write this data somewhere, right? So, what do you recommend? On the other hand, disk is slow, so we have a contradiction here. Yeah, yeah. We use HBase. Da data is eventually written to disk with HBase. But you can't do that while you're processing the data. So, for example, you saw today, um, just because it's relevant, you saw today MapReduce jobs, where the result of the mapping gets written to disk, the reduce reads it off a of disk, writes its results back to disk. That's, that is putting data on disk while it's being processed. You can't, in our environment, you can't do that. There's just no way to make that work. When you're all done with the data, all this aggregation summarization is done, then you can store it on disk. Yep. No, on memory. Thank yep. you. Hi, Don. Uh, I see that you have 
pods of uh, 1,000 servers each to support. Uh, do you have any customer that needs more than one pod? And what is the interface that they need to access uh, multiple pods and maybe integrate from both or whatever? Yeah, great question. Uh, yes, we do have multiple. We, we do have um, customers that use more than 10,000, uh, have more than 10,000 servers and so forth. And they, they exist on multiple pods. Uh, and, and we have a, um, you, we have a mechanism with, it's just a real simple mechanism that allows you to, um, in three areas. One, you have to be able to route the data from remote collectors to the right pod. Uh, we do that with a configuration file. So we manage from a central area the configuration file for the remote collectors, and that tells the, the remote collector where to send its data. You have to, um, when you come in on a browser or when you come in from APIs, have to know where to get data. I didn't talk at all about the query of the, of the data. All the queries are done in a central location. There is no information stored about where data is except in a centralized query area. That query process, processor and processing, excuse me, knows where data is across pods and, and is able to, to locate it. And um, so there, there's additional work that goes on to, to do that. Um, the other thing I'll quick mention, somewhat related is, with a pod model like this, it's, it's possible for us to put pods in our environment that we own, in a hosted environment. We also can then take pods and put, put them behind our customers' firewalls. Right, so if somebody doesn't want to upload data over the internet to us, we put the pod, you can put a pod behind their firewall. And we've just said to people when they want to do that, that we have to have access to be able to, to those machines that make up the pod. We don't want access to your system. So that we just look at that as another pod. So we've got three pods over here and one behind your firewall. That's okay, it's just another pod. You know, that's how we manage it. Okay, thank you for your time.